it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Beyond the four dimensions that man is aware of, there lies a mysterious fifth. It is a realm that is as big in size as the universe itself and as timeless as eternity. It rests between the depths of man's worries and the pinnacle of his knowledge and is the nexus between light and gloom, science and superstition. Well, they say that everyone carries their demons with them. In tonight's story, we'll see how true that is. The last drive-in theater I ever visited. This is the story of a monster. My name's Harold Brown. I'm six foot one, built like a Viking. Short and thick tree trunk legs, huge torso, big paunch, thick blonde hair, blue eyes, hair everywhere and gigantic arms capped by ham-sized fists. Suffice to say, when I go to Renaissance fairs, it's always as William Wallace. I go to a university in California, one of the last good ones, a hidden gem, really. And five months ago, I met my girlfriend, Cassandra. How we met is the stuff of, at once, dreams and nightmares. I was behind her in a drive through late at night and saw some guy climb into her cup. I followed after her, frantically honking and flashing my brights to get her attention, but she evaded me, not knowing of the monster hiding behind her. Because I grew up on the farms and ranches surrounding this town, I quickly located the back roads they'd gone down and called in the police. Cassandra was still alive, and I met with her again after she was released from the hospital. Yeah, I knew I had to ask her out after the cops tried to take the bag of fast food that was in her car for evidence, and she ferociously snatched it back and mauled the burger in half a minute, in spite of being stark as and red as a tomato from head to toe, thanks to the bleach she'd been dunked in by that psycho. Coffee. Movies. The great hole-in-the-wall restaurants I know around town. None of which were drive through since she'd officially sworn off of them. And whatever else a pair of students on a shoestring budget could manage. Her cascade of wine-red hair, which reminded me of my field of study. Her mother-of-pearl skin and her vibrant blue eyes all marked a young woman who knew her way around an animal cell. I'd regale her with talk of wine and winemaking. Geekery. The time I was shot while working as a security guard at the Santa Barbara County Fair and Expo and books I grew up with. Star Wars' expanded universe. Raptor Red and Snow Crash, if you must know. And she would bless my ears with descriptions of cellular mitosis. Star Trek, which got her into science because Mr. Spock's her hero. Oh, and Mystery Science Theatre 3000. I was already a fan, but she helped me truly appreciate the skits in between the movie segments. <laughs> she called me her big Viking wolf. I call her my little Spitfire Fox. To be honest, I probably wouldn't have met or talked to her or any other girl there at that university. It's not that I'm shy. Of the Myers-Briggs personality types, I'm an INFJ. Introverted, intuitive, feeling, judging. The rarest of them all. Great privacy, but great empathy. A healer, a crowd pleaser, but someone preferring their alone time and their own headspace. But more than just that, I struggle with feelings of intense self-hatred, none of which manifest on the surface because my nurturing nature doesn't want to spread that around. How do I find validation? Through helping others. Counseling helped and probably saved my life, but that self-hatred still pops up. All of it prompted by a traumatic three years when I was nine at the hands of an ex-sister-in-law. But for now, these days, I had managed to find a wonderful young woman who saw past my imperfections to the person under the carefully constructed mask. Oh, dating bliss at last. 
We had to be careful, though. In our town, there's a significant homeless population and some gangs, too. Most of the latter didn't bother with students, unless someone was behind on a drug tab, and most students' vices were beer and video games. And the former, well, they were usually pretty chill. There's even a mural of one, dubbed the Pirates, thanks to his eye patch and haggard demeanour. Every time a student would see him, they'd pump a fist and shout, Arr, matey! And the pirate would shout, Arr, matey, back! Nice guy. Loves Dos Equus beer, and if you buy him a drink or sandwich, he'll regale you with stories from his time working on a freight ship that are so outlandish and so ridiculous, they absolutely must be true. Unicorn Man. So named for the single dreadlock sticking up from his head at all times. Oh, he was a professor at the university until something he was researching just broke his mind. The Cop. Named because of the tattered police shirt and cop hat he wore, was an abandoned Down Syndrome baby, but the man could be trusted to walk women safely home on dark and frightening nights. Yeah, real class act, the cop. Then there's some of the unsafe ones. The Martian, who thinks aliens are going to invade. Pigpen, who's only held together by all the parasites he carries holding hands. And Tapeworm, who was a dried up, crap spattered tail sticking out of his hands that's composed of the half-dead tapeworms dangling out of him he keeps yelling about how his son was taken by polar bears. He was just a student that cracked from pressure and never went home. He'd become violent towards anyone with a small dog or cat, demanding they give him his son back and spend a night in jail. Once upon a time, we had institutions that helped these people, but because a relative few psychos turned them into their own personal Dr. Mengler playgrounds, well, they mostly got closed down. Things everywhere would have been different if these folks got the help they needed. Oh, but, well, I digress. One evening, when we'd finished our studies over a plate of taquitos and guacamole that had grown cold and limp and dark green, respectively, Cassandra looked up from her book and shut it with a heavy thud. Let's go see a movie, she exclaimed, grinning that adorable way that she did. Oh, as long as it's not the Star Wars prequel, I groaned. She scoffed, as if you even had to say it. Oh, after what Jar Jar Abrams did to Star Trek, I'm not wasting time on that, Huey. See? Dream woman. Okay, so, um, how about Ant-Man? I asked. Oof! I haven't seen much in way of the Marvel movies, she shrugged. Got one you want to see then? I asked as I stood up, slipping my huge work boots on. The boots, Cassandra joke, could be used as lifeboats in the event of a catastrophic flood. I don't know. What do you want to see? She asked, twirling a strand of that red hair around a finger. Very helpful, Foxy. Um, well, Mad Max Fury Road sounds like fun. I supplied. She tilted her head in thought. I'd shown her all three movies after I discovered our mutual love of Fallout, and she liked Thunderdome the most. Well, I'm more of a Road Warrior fan myself. Okay, Fury Road it is, she chirped. It was wonderful to see her cheering and smiling like this. She was shaky and paranoid the first month after her ordeal, but, well, time... Dates and distracting schoolwork and recreation has got a way of helping you forget the horrors that have been visited upon you. I checked the listings on my phone, and the only showing that would conclude at a civilised time was at a drive-in theatre. It had been in town for as long as anyone could remember, near a trailer park. Every Sunday, there'd be a swap meet there, and on occasion, we'd pay a visit to see what second-hand goodies we could find. I mentioned this. And Cassandra hesitated, biting her lip anxiously. Hey, it's all right. We can wait for another showing. We'll find another movie, I said with a smile, scratching my fingers up and down her back the way she liked. No, no, it's okay. Let's go. I shouldn't let some scary crap define me for the rest of my life. She shot to her feet, 
a fist melodramatically thrust in the air. God, what a dork. What a beautiful, wonderful dork. Taking my truck, we stopped at a gas station on the way to grab snacks. Since movie theater snack prices are usually somewhere between kidney and firstborn child. But, at Cassandra's insistence, we got fresh popcorn from the concession stand. Oh, I've got to support the local business, after all. Fortunately, we like our popcorn the same way. Drenched in that fluid they somehow get away with calling butter, and generously salted to the point that the mere sight of the torso-sized tub of pop kernels caused our arteries to shrivel up like twigs. Armed with our gas station candy, sodas and popcorn, we drove to a spot, tuned the radio to the drive-in frequency, and relaxed. Ahead of us, another couple in a little blue Prius were watching, frequently tearing themselves away to steal kisses while the cocker spaniel dog in the back stole mouthfuls of popcorn. Well, I relaxed. Cassandra kept reaching into her purse to feel the comforting grip of her taser, the same one that had ended the life of her would-be murderer. She eventually settled down, sampled some popcorn, nibbled on her Snickers bar and sipped at her soda pop. The film was extremely exciting, and it drew Cassandra in. I kept looking over at her, making sure she felt comfortable and was enjoying herself. That was more important to me than the film. Around the time Max blew up the guy decked out in ammo, oh, I want that hat now, by the way, the intermission came. Fifteen minutes to get out of the car, relax, get a snack or use the facilities. Cassandra needed the latter most, and before asking me to go with her, I offered to escort her myself. Making sure I locked my truck, smiling reassuringly at her, I took her along to the restrooms. One of these brick affairs set up near the same building they kept the projectors in and sold concessions from. I waited outside and surveyed the dark landscape of cars, watching snacks and drinks dance invitingly on the screen. Yeah, real subtle. I leaned against the bricks near the women's restroom entrance, gazing up at the stars. You can make out most of them, given the small size of the towns around here. I heard jingling and clicking approaching from the drive through and glanced down, seeing the dog, that popcorn-stealing cocker spaniel, trotting along, leash trailing behind it. Uh-oh, looks like we got a jailbreaker. I exclaimed with a laugh, bringing my giant boot down on the leash before leaning down to seize it. Let's get you back to your folks, silly boy. I walked the dog back towards our spot, and noticed the car ahead of my truck had its driver door wide open and was completely empty. I glanced towards the concession stand, spotting a few people, but none of them looked like the couple from the car. I started to walk towards it when the dog became immediately agitated, barking, growling and making a real fuss. Easy now, buddy. It's all right. I consoled the unhappy canine. I'm sure they're okay. That sounded like a hollow lie even to myself. I slowly rounded the back of the couple's car and peered into the cabin. It was completely dark, so I fished out my phone and turned on the flashlight, shining it into the park Prius dark, red, soaking the upholstery and the console. Oh my god. I saw a bloody hand sticking out from under the car, and the dog let out a mournful whimper. I scooped him up under one arm and scrambled like the devil himself when nipping at my heels, darting back to the concession stand. I banged a fist on the door to the women's restroom. Occupied, Cassandra snarled from inside. Give me a minute. Cassie, baby, lock the door in there. Don't unlock it. I bellowed, then staggered to the concession stand, scaring the crap out of the poor, acne-riddled freshman with dark circles under his eyes, manning the place. Holy shit, dude, he yelped, bloodshot eyes widening in surprise. Listen, call the police. Someone's been hurt, I yelled. He stared at me for a few moments, jaw slack. Uh, what? 
A sceptical mumble struggled its way from his mouth. Murder. Call cops. Freaking now, I bellowed, banging my fist on the counter for emphasis, then ran all the way back to the truck, panting hard. I tossed the dog into the back and snatched Cassandra's taser from her purse. I spun around just in time to see a dirty, haggard face framed by stringy, greasy hair and a pair of venomously angry, dark brown eyes boring into mine. I got a half second to let out a startled shout before I felt a cold impact in my abdomen, accompanied by a rigid stiffness. It was tapeworm, and he just buried an old kitchen knife in my belly. I could tell it had penetrated abdominal muscles, but where the knife wound up, it was mostly adipose that was pierced. And the thick shall inherit the earth. <laughs> I'm a gentle soul by nature, and can count on one hand the number of fights I've been in. One time when I was in 4-H, one more thing I have in common with Cassie, I held off a gang of kids from beating up my little brother. At Boy Scout camp, I got into a fight with a big lummox who picked on me excessively. And thirdly, I was shot in the torso by an idiot punk with his idiot girlfriend because they wanted to get into the fair after closing hours. I did the same thing when stabbed, that I did when shot. I became enraged. I have a deep-seated rage issue stemming from a ruined childhood at the hands of the ex-sister-in-law, the one I mentioned earlier, who tortured me whenever no one was around. From between when I was nine years old to when I was twelve, when my brother divorced her for unrelated reasons, well, I never told anyone what happened, save for the counsellors and Frankly, that's a lengthy story for another time. But I always found outlets for that rage, so it never controlled me. Games. A little time at the sharpshooting range. A little kickboxing. It vented perfectly. But when this poor, broken and delusional man stabbed me, it was something he immediately regretted. My vision reddened and I leaped forward. The same way I had after that chiseled jaw punk put a bullet in me. I brought my fists down on him. Muscle toned from long hours on the farm and ranch I grew up on. Burning as I struck him across the face as he screamed. Son, get out the truck. Run away, boy. Get help. He cried to the cocker spaniel whose owners he'd butchered in a delusional stupor as I rained one blow after another down on him. You know that little bit of restraint you have? That restraint that keeps you from putting your full potential strength into a blow. That well-trained part of your super-ego that has told you it's not good to hit people. Well, in that moment, as in the three fights of my life before, that restraint fell away as I broke his jaw, cracked his cheekbone, felt his ribs crack under my unrelenting and brutal assault, as all the built-up rage, frustration, and grief inside me poured out into this man. Somewhere in all this fray, the knife had come out of me, and I was bleeding all over. By the time the police arrived, I was standing over him and was bringing a size 13 triple E work boot down on his femur, snapping it like a toothpick. All the while, the movie continued. Seems the kid in the booth was too shaken to think to turn it off. And while Immortan Joe was driving his souped-up hot rod on the big screen, the rest of the drive-in's patrons watched on, oblivious to the mayhem happening less than a hundred feet away. The cops shone their light on me. I heard them bellow at me to stop, and when I looked up at them, the rage burned still. And according to the dashcam footage I later saw, thanks to a friend of the family in the police department, they had just cause to believe I was about to attack them. This distraction, though, was enough for my gentle side, what I hope is my real self, to grab the reins again. The adrenaline rush ebbed, and after taking one step, my strength left me, like the blood of mine pooled around my feet. I collapsed. I have faint memories of Cassandra walking alongside the gurney that the paramedics had managed to get my giant self onto, holding my hand. 
She called me her warrior, her protector, her knight in shining armor. Please, no, baby, don't call me those things. She rode with me to the hospital, and I woke up to her and my family gathered around. Cassie's dorm mates were even there. Nicole, the activist girl. Jeannie, the nice but bubble-headed beauty queen who had yet to pick a major, and the perpetually cheerful and extra-thick goth, Gloria. My brothers joked about how I needed to get a slash on my torso, and my battle damage would be complete after I'd been shot and stabbed now. Mum and Dad were their usual, supportive selves. Cassandra kept calling me brave, heroic, and mighty. No, no, I'm none of those things. The detective who came to interview me, Jack Cunningham, explained that the couple that Tapeworm had attacked had not survived their injuries. Wow, you really tore up that guy, Cunningham said. I felt sick to my stomach. But not because of the dull pain where I'd been stabbed, which was throbbing with infection that a cocktail of painkillers and antibiotics was battling. I looked away from him, trying to hide my shame. Then he grinned. Can't say he didn't deserve it, Cunningham said. No, God no, don't say that. Am I going to jail? I mumbled. This completely falls under self-defense, but you beat the guy to within an inch of his life, and he's probably going to end up in the funny farm, the detective said. This is what it took. This is what it takes before people who need it get sent someplace where they can't hurt others or themselves. Oh. I'll come back with more questions and paperwork. But you go on and heal up, hero. This is pretty cut and dry, he said, giving me a thumbs up on his way out. Friends and family drifted in and out over the next week, and even the pirate sent a card saying, Tape wasn't right in the head. Shame this happened. Get well soon, brother. He'd included a gift certificate for a big bottle of honey jacks. After I got out... I would frequently glance at the other homeless folk. No, not because I was afraid of being attacked, but looking for a scowl, a frown, a dirty look, something, anything to validate how loathsome I felt. Nothing off the sort. Why couldn't people see in me what I know exists? I finally went back to my dorm, hand in hand with Cassandra in one, and the leash of the newly adopted Cocker Spaniel in the other. And after sitting down, I hammered this whole story out. The monster I mentioned when I began? No, it wasn't Tapeworm. Beating a handicapped man with no control over his actions got labelled a heroic act. It sure as hell doesn't feel heroic. The monster I referred to lives inside me. The hide to my jackal. I know, on the surface, that I'd never hurt the ones I love, even when angry. But a primal fear always hides deep down. Our brains are divided into many different parts. Know why you get a headache looking at optical illusions? That's your brain arguing over what it's seen. Whatever part of my brain that monster lives in, I pray to all that's good and holy that it's never unleashed again. That's why I've gone back to counselling. Cassandra says she's proud of me for it. She's the only one I've ever told any of this to. Well, until now. And I'll tell you all what she told me. You're worth healing. You're worth helping. You're worth being happy. I implore you, friends. Battle those demons in your soul. And don't do it alone. Once we graduate, I'm going to ask Cassandra to marry me. My tabletop game friends, Raoul and Mandy, gave me an engagement ring to give to her when the time's right. Well, I'm thinking Pismo Beach at the end of the pier, right when the moon is hovering over the ocean. Just not at a drive-in movie any time soon. Hey there. 
Thank you so much for taking the time to drop by and listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me. I put a lot of time and effort into making these videos, so it's nice to know that there's someone out there listening. Do me a little favor, would you? Click that like button, leave a comment, and if you really feel like it, why not subscribe too? Okay, happy tales everyone. See you soon.